Does anyone have to do the selling of the chametz still? Yeah. 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 Oh, I was wondering. Yeah. I do that for like my sorry my bedroom back home or my entire house at home. Even if my I don't know if family won't that. be doing like proper preparation. Your classes. mother allows you to be her shliach to. Uh, to sell the house, and house, but to sell the chametz in the house. This is the pen to lift. Is it okay to sign? What? Is it okay to do that even if like there's not like a great intention to remove it, like on their behalf? I think so. You're selling whatever chametz is in the house. There's also the matter of like my bedroom at home that like might be technically my space, my possession that I should definitely do my room. But should I do the entire house or just the room? Um, I think you should write down the whole house. <laughs> okay. We will continue. So remember, there's three things to do. You lift the pen, is number one. That means you're making the rug your agent, or you're selling the chametz to him so he can sell it. The second thing is you're writing your name and the address. And of course, if you're, if you can uh, define your room, that's even better. In the dorm, the rooms have numbers, so you can do that. The third thing is to sign your name at the end. And the fourth thing is to write where the chametz is, but you don't have to write precisely where it is, just writes wherever indicated, wherever you'll be indicating it later. Okay. Yes. Uh, what if I have something which is in a different time zone? So where and how do I sell it? Like, what if it's in the Okay, so there is... Um, oh, wait, my, my it depends where you are. In other words, let's say you're here and your stuff is in Ukraine. <laughs> Or wherever it is. And then there's a possibility that you're there and your stuff is here. I'm here and like I want to sell stuff which is in Ukraine, right? If you're here and you want to sell stuff that's in Ukraine, it's not a problem. <laughs> if you're here and you sell it to a rub that's here, it goes by here. Everything goes according to here. Right. Well, like I'm selling it and it gets back to me earlier. And like it's still basically in Ukraine, right? No. No. When you're selling it here, it's seven hours earlier than there. Right. So when the rub sells it back to you, it's seven hours. No, we're creating seven hours ahead of us. Right. So when the rub sells it back to you, basically is seven hours over already over there. Um, the other way around is the problem. But not if, if you're in the same place where the rub is, where you're selling it, it's, either way, it's not a problem. Oh, okay. But if you're in one place and your chametz is another place, and the rub is in another place, then it's a question. Okay, I see things. Yeah. Um, what about a storage unit that has your stuff, but you don't know the address? <laughs> you don't know the address? Um, <laughs> it might be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you do have a halacha teacher here. You have a teacher who's one of the rabbis in the entire community who know the answer to the question better than me. Yeah. Baruch Hashem, I have who to refer you to. If you remember anything, this uh, paper until sometime to the beginning of next week. So if you meet any of the other students that didn't do it yet, they want to reach me and they want to do it, so we can arrange that. Okay, so we have we have uh, three days left. So let's try to see how much we can cover. We'll go to page fifty nine now.
So this is a, a few words about the carbon Pesach. So we know that in the times of the Beis Hamikdash, by the way, there's more here if anyone needs. What? Yeah, use this better. This this one. Yeah. Use this the one with the plastic. Okay, so the reason why the carbon peso, the carbon peso on the times of the base of Migdash was the main focus more than, I mean, the matzah and the carbon peso. In fact, that's why it's called Pesach because of the carbon peso. So, what was it? It was to take a, a sheep. Why a sheep? So, the answer is because. The sheep was the animal that the Egyptians worshipped. This was their avodazara. They bowed to it, they worshipped it. And if it sounds very strange to you, you should know that today in India, it's still that way. Wow. They worship animals. <laughs> I think that someone told me that's where the expression comes from, holy cow. So then the cows are holy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the holy sheep. So because here they were going to destroy the clip of Mitzrayim, so therefore Hashem said to bring a carbon of the sheep. <clears throat> now, that means that there's also a sheep in Kedusha. By the way, okay, so look at page 59, on top of the page, it says number two, Mazel Nisan Taleb. Flares, in other words, for a sheep, for a lamb, each month has a mazel, the constellations. And of course, um, constellations is part of Torah. In other words, when people say, oh, constellations, isn't that Avodah Zara? No, it's Avodah Zara if you worship them. But the fact that there are constellations and they have, and these constellations have uh, influence on things that are happening down here, is just like the sun shines and has influence on things that grow and the moon has an influence on things down here. The constellations have an influence. What we believe is that the sun has no independent power and the moon has no independent power and the constellations have no independent power, but the constellation of, of Nisan is a sheep. Page 59 in the booklet. There's what? There's one in the chat. There's two fifty nines. Yeah. You're right. Two fifty nines. Well, what kind of learning is it? It wouldn't be two of the same. You know. <laughs> so it's the first fifty nine. So their Aveda was to destroy the Avodazara of of the sheep. So just to explain a little bit, what is sheep in Kedusha and what is sheep in Klippa? So sheep in Klippa, even though it was the worship, what they worship, but what kind of character trait is there in sheep that could represent Klippa? And what ways in Klippa? So if you take a look at page uh, 61, this is a Pasuk in Tanakh, in Yirmiyahu, and in this passage, he's rebuking the Yidin. Uh, it's underlined in the Hebrew, it's underlined in the English. And in the Hebrew, it says, Seb Zura Yustro. Again, Seb is the, the word for sheep. In the English, it says, Israel is like scattered sheep. What does that mean? The nature of a sheep is to follow. So following could be positive, it could be negative. If it's the kind of following, like, I don't have any real tr true principles. I don't go by what's MS. I just go with the flow. So if everybody around me is doing something, that's what I'll do. They're doing something different, that's what I'll do. And unfortunately, that's what led to assimilation, that you didn't live amongst the nations of the world, and they act in a certain <laughs> way, and you want to follow and do it. That's what he means when he's rebuking them. You're like a sheep that's scattered, which means instead of going to your owner, to your master and being with him, being loyal and devoted to him, instead you're following others and you're going away. On the other hand, 
sheep could be Kedusha. Why? Because sheep have in the nature, we said the other day, if you remember, the other word for sheep in Hebrew is tzayim. Comes from the word tzay, which means to go out of yourself, to step out of yourself. And in fact, sheep are sort of little because they're aggressive, like an ox or like other animals. And that's why they follow, in fact, because they have in this nature of bittel. But the bittel could be kedusha and could be klipa. So if it's kedusha, then it's the ultimate of kedusha, because bittel is the highest thing in kedusha. Following whatever is out there, then it's the union of klipa. So on uh, Pesach, the Aveda is to get rid of the set of klipa and to replace that with a sheet of kedusha. <clears throat> There's a Pasuk, and that's number four on the list. The Pasuk is, do we have it here? No, I don't. The Pasuk is in, in the Chumash and the Parsha, where it talks about the Korban Pesach. It says, Mishchul Ukhul Lachem. Mishchul means pull and take to yourself a sheep. And the reason for this is there was a mitzvah then, besides the fact that they had to bring the carbon of sheep, they were told to take the sheep four days before, earlier than Pesach, tie it to their bed, and to prepare it for the carbon Pesach. And the reason for that was, yes? Wait, four days earlier, but it was three days of being tied to the post and then one day of being like they're taken, or it's four days where you're tied up? Um, what? How many days they were tied up? Three. You thought three. Maybe four. I don't know. And I said four. No, I, I think it's four. Was but really, it four days and three nights, or like three nights. Really, it was actually tied up even before that. It was tied up on Shabbos. That year, when Nidu went at time, was a Thursday. And on Shabbos was the day that they tied it up. So it's more than three days, more than four days. And, and why did they tie it up? To prepare it, that this sheep is designated. But in the meantime, what they did, they really provoked the Egyptians. This is their Abu Dazara. It's their God. It's holy. And they tied it up. So the Egyptians asked the Jews, why are you tying up the sheep to the bed? And the and the Yidin answered because before Pesach we're going to bring a carbon and sacrifice the sheep. And they they went uh, you know ballistic. How could you do that? It's our sheep. So he said because right before Pesach is going to be another plague where the firstborn of the Egyptians are going to die and we're going out. So the firstborn made a, uh, a revolution. They made a big, a big uh, war against Egypt. They went out to fight, and there was a big war. In fact, part of that, a lot of the Egyptians, especially the Bukhorim, the firstborn, they were the ones who were fighting because they saw that everything Moshe Rabbeinu said was fulfilled. So this will also be fulfilled. And what happened was that there was a war, and many Egyptians were killed. And in fact, that's the reason why we this Shabbos is called Shabbos Agodo. We have another page dedicated to Shabbos Agadol. We'll go more into it. But this was considered the beginning of the exodus of Mitzrayim. It was on a Thursday, but it really started on Wednesday. That was the big crack in the wall. That was when the Egyptians were fighting against the Egyptians. So we'll go into that later. But the question is, one of the reasons why Hashem told them to tie it up to the bed is another reason. That in order to go out of Mitzrayim, they had to show openly that they're no longer intimidated by Egypt and they're not afraid to openly say that we're going to destroy the Avodah Zorah of Mitzrayim. Yeah. But the firstborn in Mitzrayim started a war with the other Mitzrayim? The yeah, Mitzrayim? they started a war with the so establishment. It was like a civil war. It was a civil war, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, um, just to reiterate, you're saying that they tied the sheep up to the bedpost so that they would explain themselves to the mitzri and say that they're going to bring this as a carbon. And they, in the mitzri, they worship sheep. Right. 
So in a sense, their tying it up to the bed was part of their exodus. They had to be, it reminds me a little bit of, uh, it, perhaps it's similar, that unfortunately, a lot of Jews will end up in cults. So there's a whole process of, of uh, deprogramming. I don't know if you're aware of this, that one of the rabbis there across the street who's in charge of the whole um, learning program in the summer, Rabbi Shiach, it was a time that this was his main occupation. He wrote, gave out a book, it's called Cold Busting. Uh, cold, cold Busting. He was very involved in it. So what happened was when they finally got someone out of the cult, they were so attached, they were so programmed and so attached that they, they still somehow couldn't let go. So they had to work very hard to let go. Even if they decided, okay, it's not for me, it's a wrong thing, I'm being controlled, I'm being brainwashed, and they left. And they wanted to start keeping Yiddishkeit. You know what the breaking point was? They had to do something, and that was the breaking away point. They had to be ready to burn the picture of the cult leader. If they're ready to do that, which means they're ready to destroy the Abu Zara, then they were able to let go. There's in fact a story that's, uh, that Rabbi Mangel would tell the story that he, there was a Jewish kid who came from a from home that got involved in a cult. So we're going back years in the 1960s. And unfortunately, you know, the parents were devastated. They tried everything and eventually they worked on him and they got him out of the cult. But they couldn't get him to do this last stage of burning the picture of the Abu No matter how much they tried, he was back home. He was keeping Shabbos, doing everything, but still connected to the cult. And Rabbi Mangel was involved. Apparently he wrote into the Rebbe, what can we do to get that final breakaway? So being that he came from a from home, but a modern Orthodox home, he was eating kosher, but not chol yisro. And the Rebbe said he should start eating only chol yisro. And as soon as he changed to chol yisro, he was ready to burn the picture, and he was ready to break away. So I guess sacrificing the Abu Zara of Mitzrayim, that was our way of, of letting go and, and getting rid of it. So this is, I don't have this in English, but just to, just to show you the source, look at plus page 59, the second 59, the other one that's 59. It says you should not eat it rare or boiled. Rare, what does rare mean? It means uh, not not cooked. Raw. raw should be probably raw. Or boiled in water, except roasted over the fire, its head with its legs, the, the whole sheet as it is. So you turn the page. There's one of the Mepharshim. I underlined it. If you have a magnifying glass and you know Hebrew well, you'll understand it. But this is one of the Mepharshim on the Chumash. And he says... What's the reason why it had to be this way? So he says, because this was part of the idea was to destroy Abu Dhar bin Sraim and not to care what the Egyptians said. So the Yidden was saying, maybe we can cook it. So if it's cooked, it's covered in a pot. Nobody's going to know that this is the sheep. So Hashem said, no, it should be open. So they said, maybe we can cut up certain parts so you still can recognize that it's a sheep. So he said, no, it should be done as it is, everything, the head and leg, the whole animal as it is, so it's obvious. And on top of that, when you do something that's roasted, the smoke and the smell goes through the whole place, which means everybody's aware of what you're doing. And that was, and that was what they were needed to do to break away from its shrine, that they can openly break away from that, uh, from that Abu Dazar that they were worshiping. So I guess on a personal level as well, we are going out of Mitzrayim, which means we're not has shalom, being influenced by our surroundings, and we're not interested in to go with the flow. We know there are many Jews who are religious Jews, they're observant Jews, but they're embarrassed to walk in the street with a yarmulke, embarrassed to walk in the street with the tzitzah sticking out, other things that are similar to that. Some people don't let their beard grow because of that reason, but a yid, when he's really truly connected to Hashem, then it doesn't matter, he's ready, he feels very, it, it, the fact that I'm embarrassed means that I'm not feeling the true sense of pride of being who I am. 
if I would truly, fully be proud of being a yid and being proud of the fact that Hashem gave me Torah and mitzvahs, then I would never be embarrassed of the fact that there are other people out there that don't understand it and they're, they're laughing at it. Okay, let's move a little bit. Page 62. I hope there's only one of them this time. Page 62, we'll talk a little bit about the Eser Makis. First of all, why did Hashem make 10 Makis? And second of all, why these Makis? If you think of it, Hashem is really very creative. Fr frogs, lies. I mean, you, could, if you want to really annoy them. There's so many different things you can do. So it's not like people sitting down, how could we really annoy the Egyptians? Ah, frogs, it's a great idea. <laughs> Lice is a great idea. This is a great idea. Obviously, there must be something behind it. So what is it? So the answer to this is that there are, of course, so many things in mitzvahs, in Torah, in, in, in our history that have to do with the number 10. And I'm sure I'm going to show you a list of some of the things. And the Hasidus had always explained that if you see something connected to the number 10, it's because it corresponds to the 10 spheres. So, for example, you turn to page 63. And what you're looking at is Pirkei Avos, chapter 5. I doubt if you remember it from my class of Pirkei Avos, because I don't do chapter 5. Okay. If you do remember it, something's fishy. Okay. <laughs> so, the first one says... It says, Hashem created the world in 10 utterances. You see that? Then it says there are 10 generations from Adam until Noyach. Yeah. And then it says there are 10 generations from Noyach till Avram. Let's turn to the page. Then it says there are 10 tests that Avram tested, Hashem tested Avram. Then it says there were 10 miracles that Hashem performed in the Mitzrayim. And there are 10 makas. And there are 10 that Hashem performed by the, by the sea. And then it says that there are 10 miracles that Hashem performed on a daily basis in the base of English. And then it says there are 10 things that Hashem created before Shabbos. So what is this all about? Basically, it means everything in the world is made up of 10 parts, which correspond to the 10 spheres. <clears throat> so therefore, whatever it is that happened, and it was meant to happen, something was meant to be taking place, in order for that, whatever it is to be done in a complete way, it was done in stages of 10, in order to transform or to affect or to penetrate the chokhmah, the bina, the das, the chesed. So for example, when it says Hashem created the world with 10 utterances, it means everything in the world was created with the 10 spheres. Now we know that these are the ingredients of the whole creation, this is the DNA of the whole creation. So therefore, when Hashem spoke to create the world, he created with these 10 spheres. One is Chochmah, one is Bina, one is Das, Chesed, we're until we come to Malchus. The same is when it says the 10 generations from Adam to Noyach. It's not just something biological. The parents had children, the children had children. But if you look more into it, it means that the world had to go through a certain process of development from Adam till Noyach. That process took 10 generations. Why 10? Because the process was, whatever, it, whatever the process was, was related to Chochmah, Bina, Das, and to Malchus. Yeah. When you say it's 10, it's such a significant number. So what about seven? I was waiting for that question. Thank you very much. In fact, if you look on page 64, after it finishes with the 10, it starts yeah. with the number seven. And then what about the number three? So why do we eat three matzahs? We should eat 10 matzahs. <laughs> why do we have four kashas? We have 10 kashas. So obviously the answer is that generally speaking, there are 10, but the 10 spheres can also be classified, defined different ways. So sometimes we say that generally speaking, all the spheres, even though there are 10, but they're broken up into the right, the left, and the center, or chesed, gevura, and teferis. And sometimes we say they're in two categories in general, and there's the chesed and the gavura. Sometimes we say it's seven because there are seven emotions. Sometimes we say it's three because there's chok, mabina, das. So the answer to all this, you understand what's going on. Each of these, each of these cases of the 10, once you understand the spiritual, um, um, opinion that's happening, 
then you will, it gets easier to understand. So this is 10, this is seven, this is eight. And this is, there's a reason. Five, because there's a place that the, the Torah has to do. But why does the Torah have five parts? Because there's five aspects in Hashem's name, the Yud Ke Bobke, and there's the thing on top of the Yud. So you, every time you learn about any of these numbers, it all revolves around the 10 spheres, but it's just the 10 spheres from a different aspect. I'm trying to think of a mushroom. Yes, Rivka. I, I just want to be like a little bit more precise. Like, where is it like seven blocks and cherries? So, like, now you said that, like, the generation was such a need to you know, off and on the ground. And I'm saying, like, if they're made of 10, so, like, by here, we're seeing that we need seven only. I'm saying, right. like, so, I mean, it's all about it. I forget it. So obviously the answer is in every situation, if you would understand what, whatever the Indian is, what is its spiritual purpose, what's happening?